right, hello everybody. I'm Marina Moore, I'm a PhD candidate at NYU and I've been a maintainer of the Tuff project for the past five years or so. Um, and this is my colleague, Trishank. Hello, Trishank Arde Gupsami, um, staff security engineer at Datadog. I've been involved with Tuff in various capacities since my research on it at NYU and now using it at Datadog to secure some of our own products. Marina, please. Yeah, and we're gonna talk today about um, Secure transport for your software supply chain with Tuff. So we'll talk a bit about what Tuff is, and then um, some various case studies about how it can be used to um, secure transport of different different elements in the software supply chain. First of all, I'll start with a quick definition of what a uh, supply chain is, just so that we're all on the same page. A software supply chain, by this definition, is a collection of systems, devices, and people which produce a final software product. And there's an example here of kind of the different steps that happen in a software supply chain. Things from um, source code, to testing, to building, to then deployment of, of that code. And there can be other steps um, in the chain as well. There have been a number of attacks on supply chains in recent years, unfortunately. Um, just to, to motivate the problem, here are a few examples. Everything from dependencies to um, repositories themselves to source code um, being attacked. These are just from the past couple years. I won't go into detail about all of them. Um, and at the bottom of this slide, I do have a link to the um, tag security catalog of supply chain compromises where these came from and which have a lot more detail for folks who are curious. Um, the main point is this is a, a, an area that attackers have discovered and so we wanna make sure that we also are protecting it. Um, and today in this talk, we're not gonna focus on the whole thing we're gonna focus really on this last step. Once you already have an a image that is built, you have a packaged piece of software, um, how do you then distribute that securely to the person who's gonna run it? And our threat model for this, um, for this, for this talk is um, attackers who can access a couple different pieces of the system. They can perform a man in the middle attack that, on the network, which means they can read the traffic, alter the traffic between the repository and the user. Uh, they can compromise keys used to sign updates. So the keys themselves, um, they can get lost, computers can get stolen, all that kind of thing. Or compromise the repositories or servers themselves. And given this environment, we wanna be able to protect the freshness, consistency, and integrity of, of our software. And to do this, we use this concept of compromise resilience, which means that even in the event that all of these things we talked about, these repositories, keys, or developer accounts are compromised, we wanna reduce the impact of the compromise and allow secure recovery, even if and when these compromises do occur. How does Tuff do this? So I'm gonna do a very quick overview of kind of the architecture of Tuff, the, the key pieces um, to understand. Um, and for more detail, I do encourage folks to look at our specification or other kind of more detailed intro talks. So I'm gonna do a quick intro so that we can get into some, some fun case studies. Um, so for this, for this design, we're gonna start with a particular package, we're calling it foo, um, that, that someone wants to distribute securely. And also, this doesn't have to be a, a piece of software. We'll get into more, this more in the case studies, but other things could also be securely distributed this way, which should become clear as we, as we talk about it. So anyway, the first thing we wanna do is protect the integrity of this content. One kind of way that this can be done is by doing a cryptographic signature on the content itself. Um, the problem with attaching the signature to the content, it's kind of two big problems. First of all, if you attach, if you put this bundle of signature with the content and then you wanna sign it a second time or, or change the signature, a change to the signature changes the whole contents. So these signatures kind of have to stack in a funny way. Um, so what we do instead is have a separate object that actually includes the cryptographic hash of the thing that we're protecting and then there's a signature on that instead. So we have this foo.json, which the foo developer has, and they say, okay, we're releasing foo 1.0, we're gonna list it in this metadata file, sign it with A. The next problem we have is that, um, so we now can distribute foo, foo securely by um, distributing the signature, but how do we actually know the, the trusted key A? Like, how do we know who this is that's supposed to be signing this foo metadata file? And what we do is we add this thing called targets metadata in Tuff, which points to you know, the targets, the different packages, or the different metadata about the packages. Um, 
and it lists the trusted key for each package. In this very simple example, we just have one package. So this is a very small thing, but you can imagine this listing, you know, tens or hundreds of different um, projects as well as the keys that are used to trust those, to, um, to sign those different projects. And that, of course, is also signed. Um, and you know, there has to be a, a bottom journal sometime, right? So <laughs> if you keep signing things, saying who else is signing things, we eventually have to figure out where this all is coming from. And the way we do this securely in, in Tuff is with something called multi-signature trust. So this root of trust, our root metadata file in Tuff, is signed with a collection of root keys. And these root keys can be um, the Yuba keys or offline keys, HSMs, that are stored in different physical locations um, and protected that way to kind of give a maximal root of trust. And this one, this particular metadata file can change less often, right? If anything needs to change with um, who's supposed to sign what, this, this metadata itself doesn't need to change because it only indicates B, which then signs for A, and so on. Okay, so what happens now if um, this Foo developer wants to release another version of Foo? Um, Foo 1.0 is still valid, and they still want to, um, people still can use it, but they also want to say, there's also this new version, Foo 2.0. So they can add it to the, um, the, meta, the this, this Foo JSON metadata file, resign it, and so on. The problem is, how does a user know if they're getting the most recent collection? If they want the most recent version of Foo, how can they guarantee that they're getting a foo.json that includes the most recent version that they want to download? And to, to ensure this, we have what we call repository consistency. So we put version numbers on each of these metadata files included in the signed metadata. Um, targets JSON, we haven't changed since we created it in this, in this presentation, so that's v1. We made one change to foo, so that's gonna be v2. We then list these different versions in what's called a snapshot um, and sign that with a key listed in, in the root. So this is also um, similarly protected and then we, we know if we, if we check this snapshot and all of our versions are listed in the snapshot, we know we have um, the, the current state of the repository at this time. We do wanna also make sure this is current, right? So we have finally, our last element is freshness, which is um, just another metadata file that has the current time and a hash of the current snapshot to make sure this is all currently up to date. And this is our very fast overview of Tuff, um, and hopefully that's enough to get started. Um, we can learn more about some of the details of this as we go. The Tuff project is this one specification that describes all that stuff I just talked about in a lot more detail, as well as um, the implementations in a variety of different languages, including Python, Go, Rust, et cetera, um, and more than 20 deployments by different, um, both companies and open source organizations. Um, a few of whom are, are on this slide here. And I'll do some very quick project updates about, in case you've heard of the project before, what's new, what, what to, to look for. Um, in the past kind of like five years or so, there's been a lot of work on the client side of Tuff. So, uh, Basically, there's two sides to Tuff, right? There's this repository that creates all that metadata that we talked about, and there's a client who actually verifies all that metadata and makes sure that all, all the correct things are signed by the correct people. Um, and so there's been a lot of great work on the client side, and so in the past year or so, we've kind of shifted to doing some great work on the repository side to make this super, super easy to deploy in different cases. So two projects that I'll mention are RSTuff and Tuff on CI. RSTuff really focuses on kind of this high volume um, case and it has a lot of great features for scalability um, inspired by kind of the Python packaging index use case um, and it's used there as well. And then Tough on CI kind of is a, a different kind of implementation that focuses more on this high security, low volume um, type of thing which is more about actually distributing things like, um, the, more like using it as a root of trust, distributing other keys kind of smaller scale repositories. Um, and for example, the, the Sigster project is, is, is looking to transition to, to Tough on CI for an easier way to, to run that. Um, next we have GoTuff metadata, which is a rewrite of GoTuff, um, inspired by some of the work that happened in Python Tough before, just to make the, the um, implementation a lot more readable, maintainable, usable, um, so if anyone here has been using GoTuff, this would be a great call out to, to look into that, give us some feedback, let us know how, how that's going. We're gonna start transitioning over to, um, 
supporting this more full time than, than GoTuff. And finally, I'll call out GitTuff, which is a, um, not exactly a tough implementation, but it's an implementation inspired by Tuff to use tough type concepts to secure a Git repository and manage things like, do things like key management and trust management for Git repositories. Um, I'll also highlight that RSTuff, Tuff on CI, and GitTuff are actually all incubating um, OpenSSF projects now, so that's pretty exciting for all of them. And finally, I'll talk a bit about um, some, some new proposals to and enhancements to TUF. Um, we have this process called um, TAPS, or TUF Augmentation Proposals, where we propose, talk about, and then implement new features in TUF. This is a quick list of all the ones that are currently active. Um, and I'll go into a couple of the new ones just to kind of see some of the things that we're thinking about as a project. First of all, I'll talk about TAP 16, which is snapshot Merkle trees. Um, the idea here is to make the snapshot metadata in TUF more efficient at scale. So if you remember from the, the brain dump a couple of slides ago, uh, snapshot metadata in TUF lists the name and version number of every different metadata file in a TUF repository. Um, which when there's like 10, 10 metadata files is totally fine, but if you start having millions of these different metadata files in a single repository, clearly this linear scaling starts to, to get a little bit, um, starts to get in the way. And so the idea here is to um, use a Merkle tree to um, still like tie all the different, like to still have a single snapshot, like a single tree that encompasses all of the different versions, um, but make it much more efficient for people to actually download and verify the information that they need. Um, basically, it's logarithmic instead of um, linear is the, the short version. And we have a quick graph from some experiments that show that this is true. There's an extra information there, but basically the, the, the line at the top is without using this, the line at the bottom is with using this. It makes a smaller snapshot. Um, and then next I'll talk a bit about TAP18, which the official name is Ephemeral Identity Verification Using SigStore's Fulcio for tough developer key management, which is a very long way to say that we're gonna simplify developer signatures. Basically, the, right now, in, or before this tap, I guess, in tough, um, each developer who's signing one of those metadata files listing you know, all those foo um, images has to um, have an actual cryptographic key. Either they have to have a Yubi key or they have to store this on the computer. They have to keep it secure over time, um, which can be tricky for, um, developers, especially open source developers, who don't want to have this extra overhead. And so the idea with this, with this TAP and with Fulcio is that instead you use an ephemeral key tied to an existing identity, something like a Gmail address or your GitHub identity that you as a developer already have, um, and use that instead to sign your updates. So there's a lot more information about how that works in this TAP. And finally, I'll talk a bit about TAP 19, which, uses, which is for content addressable systems and TUF. Um, to use the TUF model in systems like Git, IPFS, and OS tree. And the interesting thing here is that there's um, certain security guarantees that already exist in a content addressable system. And so this really looks at how you can combine those with TUF in a way that's both secure, you get all the kind of the, the union of the security features while simplifying some of the TUF elements because you don't need, you know, you don't need the same security property twice. Um, and there's a lot more details in, in that TUF about how, how these things interact. And next, I'll hand over to my colleague to talk a bit about some case studies about where TAF has been used in practice. Cool, thank you, that was great. Um, yeah, so as promised, let's talk about some case studies of where TAF is being used, especially in, we hope, interesting um, um, different use cases and contexts. So one of the first ones, um, Uptane, one of my personal favorites, if I may, um, you can actually make tough work in, for software updates for cars. And I don't have time to go into details, but let's just say that installing software, updating software in your vehicles um, was not the same as installing software, say, on your containers. Um, one key difference, for example, is that in your containers, you have some control, even if it's through your package manager, you do the so-called dependency resolution yourself. Um, not so for automotive uh, use case. Um, just to give you an example, you and I could have the same exact make and model of the vehicle, but because you paid for a premium package, let's say it's full self-driving, um, same vehicle, same hardware, but you get different software than I do. And so the key idea here is that you can use two repositories to do this, because if you think about it, what chooses which software gets installed in which vehicle? 
that, as I like to say, it's a robot sitting in a cloud in the sky. And you don't want to give the robot the power to make up what software gets installed. Um, the, short, the short of it is that the robot only has the power to choose software that has been signed off by human beings. So it has the power to choose what software is installed, but it is constrained to being able to uh, to use only software that has been authorized by human beings. Anyway, there's some interesting details here. So if you're interested, basically the idea generalizes to anything um, where you require fleet management, not just vehicles. So that's Uptain. Another interesting use case is actually um, to secure US legal documents. There's a version of Tough Call, um, just like there's a version of Tough Call Uptain, which actually the technology has been upstream back to Tough. Um, there's a, there's a version of TAF called the Archive Framework, or TAF for short, um, um, partly led by Justin Capos, who also happens to be one of the creators of TAF. Um, and so the idea here is interesting. So as Marina mentioned earlier with tab 19, TAF can be used to sign off on Git commit trees. So the idea here is that different jurisdictions would manage their own Git repositories for legal documents. And clearly, the commit tree evolves over time. What you're using TUF for here is to secure this another, yet another Git repository called the authentication repository. And that would point to the latest heads of each of these uh, jurisdiction repositories. And that's secured by TUF. So different pointers to different Git repositories over time. Um, so that's staff for short. And if you think about it, you can generalize it to Git repositories in general, not just to secure US legal documents, but anything you like. So in this case, as Marina alluded to earlier, there's a project on OpenSSF called Git Tough, and the lead researcher and developer happens to be here in the room, um, Aditi Asaki. It's based partly on solving a problem that a sister project was also um, in toto. Um, the lead researcher and developer, who's Santiago Torres Arias, wrote an entire paper about how there's all these attacks against Git repositories. And so GitHub is designed to solve some of these problems. Suffice it to say that just signing a Git commit is not going to solve all of these problems. So if we look here, um, what Aditi has done here is that he signed off a policy. It uses the idea of delegations from Tuff to say that anything, any changes to your main branch has to be signed off by keys belonging to Aditi Asaki. And in this case, he's actually using ephemeral keys, or short-lived keys. What you're actually binding to here, it has to be, the keys have to belong. The keys could change as often as every 10 minutes, but the keys have to belong to Aditi Asaki. So that's an interesting application of Tough, inspired by Tough, shall we say. Um, and speaking of short-lived keys, there are many ways to do this, one of which is open pub key. We don't have time to go into details, but it's an interesting way to distribute short-lived keys, which, remember, could change as often. In this case, let's say it changes every 24 hours. And the idea here is that you would use OIDC. Let's say you're using Google as your IDP provider. When you authenticate, let's say Auditia earlier authenticates himself, um, let's say to Google or GitHub. Either way, when he authenticates himself, um, he would use the same protocol to bind uh, his ephemeral key at that time. So when he gets the ID token back, the IDP would also have signed off saying, not only is this Aditya at Saki.in, but indirectly, here's also his ephemeral public key at that time. So that's open pub key. But for our use case, the interesting bit is that Docker is planning to use not only open pub key to realize short-lived keys to sign their official images, but now, but now, how do you solve the problem of knowing which OIDC identity should be trusted to sign which images? And this is where TUF also comes into play. So they're planning to use TUF to sign off on the so-called trust policy, where you can say different images must be signed off by different OIDC identities. And from there, you can find out which um, ephemeral keys you want to use. Um, speaking of ephemeral keys, um, many of you might have heard of Sigstore, um, which is yet another sister project. Um, Sigstore is a collection of a few different tools. So you might have heard of Certificate Transparency for TLS. What is the idea there? The idea is that 
you have a transparent log, or a, also known as a tamper evident log. Just think of it as a, a pen only log. It's a data structure where you can only add things, and that is verifiable. If someone tampers with it, they would get caught because they're being independently audited all the time. What can you do with such a data structure? So it's being used to record the history of every TLS certificate ever issued. It's worked very well for Google and friends. And now Sigstore takes that same idea and extends it to software artifacts in general. OK, how is that relevant to us? Sigstore, Sigstore, as I mentioned earlier, uses a few different technologies under the scenes. So there's at least two different transparent logs. We don't need to go into details here. The point is they have at least two different transparent logs. They have the full show key server, which is another way to do ephemeral keys. Point is, each one of this has its own key. Remember what Marina talked about earlier, is that if you have so many different keys, how do you distribute this key securely? How do you rotate them? How do you revoke them? Well, as you may have guessed, and they're tough. So behind the scenes, that's what Sigstore has been doing. They have their own tough metadata, where you can see through a single set of root keys, uh, you can revoke and rotate, transparently rotate. Your users don't have to be aware of how this all works, but transparently rotate the keys to the entire system um, even 10 years from now using the root keys of today. You could change even the root keys itself. So, you know, root key for each transparent log and full show and so on. And um, they, have, they, they had this tricky problem of solving the tough root key ceremony for it. Not just the root keys, actually, but also distributing all of the tough metadata. It's been through several iterations. So if you think you have a similar problem where you need to use tough to uh, manage and distribute keys for your own system, dozens, if maybe even hundreds of keys, you can take a look at how Sixdoor did it. Um, here, there are five key holders for Sixdoor. Um, distributed all over the planet geographically, different time zones. Marina happens to be one of the key, current key holders. Um, and so you can go talk to her also about how they've, they've solved the ceremony. Um, the, the plan, as Marina mentioned earlier, um, you could use this sister project called Tough and CI. The plan is to use that to make some of these things easier. Moving on, um, let's talk about how Tough plays well with different sister technologies. So at Datadog, um, as some of you may have used, uh, some of you may be using right now, it's a monitoring and observability platform where you can use it to monitor your infrastructure, your applications, and your services end to end. Um, and at Datadog, presumably, it, you, you install the agent as part of it to collect metrics and logs and so on. Now this agent has got hundreds of integrations out of the box to talk to known applications and services, databases, right? And the way we install and update the integrations is secured by Tough. It actually uses three different technologies. No time to go into details. But we use a sister project called Intoto to solve the supply chain um, security problem, where every integration that we build has to have been signed off by developers themselves. And this way, we trust, but we verify how our CI behaves in packaging these integrations. And we use Tough as the secure transfer protocol, the team of the stock. Tough as the secure transfer protocol for software artifacts. We use it to securely bind in Toto policies which evolve over time. And we same trick that Sigstore does, we also use Tough to, we've done this several times now, where we rotate the keys to the entire system and no one notices. And re more recently, we gave a talk about it at another KubeCon talk um, five years ago in Seattle. Um, and more recently, we talked about, so we have this in Toto, we have Tough, and we add a six door on top of it, remember, transparent logs, so that we record in an immutable way the entire end-to-end -end history of how every single Datadog agent integration was ever produced. So now we can say, why don't we take the same technology, the same tech stack, and apply it to open source registries in general? And this is what we're beginning to do with registries. Marina and I happen to be co-authors of a Python enhancement proposal, uh, PEP458 in short. The idea is, how do we begin securing open source registries? And this is the beginning of it. It proposes using Tough, where in the beginning, registries such as PyPI will sign all packages on behalf of developers. This is better than TLS in the sense that you can securely recover from a compromise. 
and that users who have not uh, installed um, uh, packages that have been tampered with, they can securely rotate to a new set of keys and, and move on. Um, the, the takeaway point here, though, is that previously, when we tried integrating Tough, it would take at least a few thousand lines of code. You not only had to be a, an expert in how the open source registry, such as PyPI, works, you also had to be an expert in Tough. Um, not ideal. And thanks to our friends, remember Marina talked earlier about RS Tough, repository service for Tough. Um, we can abstract it away where it becomes a simple matter of integrating with a few hundred lines of code, much more manageable. You can completely abstract it away as a, as a bunch of configurations where you tell it the shape of what, you can choose the security model and basically abstract it away. You don't even have to worry about how tough works. And it takes care of things like scaling and key management for you. So from a few thousand lines of code to a few hundred lines of code. And we're pleased to say that um, people at RubyGems have also experimented and, and achieved similar results. There was a previous PR um, from our friends at Square, actually, who helped us to try to integrate Tough with RubyGems a few years ago. Again, you can see similar results, a few thousand lines of code to a few hundred lines of code. So particularly shout out to Cairo and Yosef Simonek and friends who have shown very impressive results. And to end with the overarching theme of the talk, TUF is the secure transport protocol for supply chain. How would that work? So we propose this idea that we call Robusto in general. Think about it. Um, we have mRNA vaccines for, for COVID and so on today. If you were to take a vaccine, but you didn't know who made it, you didn't know whether anyone tampered with a bottle, opened it and closed it back, you don't even know the ingredients in it. Would you take it? Presumably not. But we do this with open source software <laughs> every single time. Um, so we can do better. And the proposal here um, is to use three sibling technologies in supply chain security. One is in Toto, which you can think of it as a manufacturer, a vaccine manufacturer telling you how they made the vaccine, what ingredients they use, how they composed it, and they have their own seal of intent, uh, you know, integrity and authenticity. Great. Tough then is the secure transport protocol on top of it that does things like, well, today we, yesterday we trusted three different ma vaccine manufacturers, but today, unfortunately, we have to revoke one of them, and today only two are good. And so you can update, and so you can, Tough basically becomes this intermediary of trust. And finally, last but not least, you can record using uh, transparent logs such as SIGSTORE, and you can even use short-lived keys to do it, uh, you can record the entire end-to-end -end history of how every, every open source software artifact was ever made. Um, and the idea here, I don't have time to go into details, but we presented a talk about it called Robusto at PackagingCon recently. But if you use stuff in a repository such as RubyGems, the key idea is as follows. You basically divide packages in the beginning, remember with things like PEP458, in the beginning, to make things as simple as possible, there's a trade-off. You don't require developers to sign their own packages. The repositories would do it on their behalf. But the trade-off then becomes that repositories have to do it in a scalable online manner. Machines have to be able to sign new packages at any time. So if you compromise the repository, all of these packages are at risk. But here's the good news. We did studies a few years ago where we found that you can slowly but surely move packages here. And if you think about it, there are simple policies that can give you a lot of bang for the buck. So take the few top, few hundred top critical open source packages, five minutes left, okay, good, thanks. Um, uh, if you take the few critical open source dependencies and move them here, just a few hundred, out of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of packages, just take the few top critical, few hundred of them, move them here, secure it, at least 80% of your downloads are protected. So, um, Again, no time to go into details, but note, note something interesting here. Through a union of each, each supply chain security technology is good at, at some things, but not everything. But if you put them together, you get this very strong property that, that your users might be looking for. And so you can come talk to us um, after the talk about it. Anyway, let's go into a quick demo. Don't have too much time. 
But anyway, this is the RS stuff um, demo that we talked about earlier, where Cairo is using RS stuff to upload <laughs> a new version of RS stuff itself. It's a bit meta to a, a staged version of PyPI here. So it's using Twine. You can see Twine is the tool that uh, Python developers use. You can see there's no change to them. It's as if there's no difference with or without Tough. So the user experience for developers and users remains the same. So he just published a new version, a beta version of our stuff. And now what he's going to do is use pip, which is the package manager for, for, for Python packages, and install it. And there's no difference from the user experience too. But they're being protected by tough, or stuff behind the scenes. They're just not aware of it. So both developers and end users are not, affair, uh, not, not aware that they're being automatically secured. I'm just going to speed it up here. This is where things are good. If you go into verbose mode, you can see that there's stuff metadata here. But let's move on to the, uh, the stuff metadata. Let's move on to an attack. So. Say a CDN has been compromised that PyPI uses. So the CDN, now someone's hacked the CDN, they're tampering with one of these Python wheels. So they're trying to pull a fast one. Will RS stuff catch it? Let's see. I hope it works. Yes, yes it does. So the length wouldn't match, the hash wouldn't match, the signature wouldn't match, you get the idea. Anyway, I'm going to move on from the demo because we're running out of time. So thanks. Thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate it. We have two minutes left. Um, before we move to Q&A, Tough wouldn't have worked without the hard work of many, many people for which we don't have the time to acknowledge. But thanks to all of you. And if you have questions, we are happy to answer them. Don't know how loud it's going to be. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, I saw that you uh, you mentioned that there's going to be an update to the Go API for Tuff. I also know there's a there's a Go Tough CLI associated with the old repo. Do you know if that's going to get updated as well? Yeah, we're definitely talking about that. I think we want there to be a CLI. It might we might move it to a separate project so that you can maintain the core functionality, core API, separate from the CLI. But there's definitely interest both from the maintainers and the community in having the CLI, so um, yes is a short answer. <laughs> Thanks. So great talk. I just want to semi-correct one tiny thing, which is the TAF work is really a lot of work by David Greeson, uh, Renata, Verdana, and others out of the Open Law Library. BJ, whose picture was up there along with mine, we just get the credit because our universities have better PR departments than <laughs> uh, in like, you know, a startup or a, a nonprofit that does this amazing work. So we're really blessed that, you know, to work with them and really proud to be protecting a lot of uh, different local uh, community governments, um, you know, that are using this. So, yes. Absolutely. Thanks for the correction. And that's one of the creators of Tough, by the way. Cool. I think we're on time. Thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you.